On this finale of our training camp battles series, we have two battles for you. Terrence Davis versus Kent Bazemore for the backup three spot and Alex Len versus Namias Keita for the third string big man spot. Brendan Nunez joins me on the Locked on Kings podcast. You are Locked on Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time, time for another episode of Locked on Kings. Hello and welcome into Locked On Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all regular season and all off season. My name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. I'm a Sacramento sports reporter and producer for ABC 10 News, and we are officially a week away from Media Day in Sacramento. Sacramento Kings Media Day is always really fun because it really kicks off the festivities. So we have Media Day. There'll be Fan Fest coming up, preseason and training camp uh, not soon or not far after that training camp really first uh, and then preseason after then sooner than you know it we're going to be in October uh, really gearing up for the start of the season we've made it through the hardest part of the year everybody congratulations and thank you for sticking it out uh, right here with me on the Locked On Kings podcast. And hopefully you've been enjoying this training camp battle series that we've been putting out, myself and Brennan Nunez of uh, the Kings Pulse podcast uh, and from Kings Beat and the Kings Herald. Brennan is all over the place, and he was nice enough to be with me every single episode here uh, of this uh, this training camp battle series. And we decided to put two battles into one here in this final episode. Terrence Davis versus Kent Bazemore, Alex Len versus Namiya Skeda. So without any further ado, here are Brennan and I breaking down these two battles and get ready to respond and throw your uh, your thoughts into the mix too because these are some good ones. Combining the final two major training camp battles into one episode, the first that we'll start with Brendan, Terrence Davis versus Kent Bazemore. Now this might seem like a, a strange battle because they're not necessarily, they could play the same position. Davis more known as a two, Bazemore more known as a three, but essentially what we're talking about here is the backup three spot. Now, I don't even know if this is going to be a consistent rotational spot. I think that Mike Brown is going to go with more of a nine man rotation and, and the 10th man would be that backup three spot uh, with Herter's ability to play the two or three Barnes's ability to play the three or four, maybe Keegan Murray's ability to play the three or the four. But if they are looking for a backup three, I think it's going to be between the two guys of, of, of Terrence Davis and Kent Bazemore. And you and I have talked about it a little bit. I know you you put up uh, out something about this uh, uh, not too long ago on, on Twitter and, and on King's Pulse. But uh, K- Terrence Davis might have emerged as your your major backup three candidate. Is that correct? It's a maybe. It's more of like... I think that there's a chance that maybe they're just viewing these positions different than I am. And for me to think there's this big hole at the backup three, like I just started a question. Maybe they think that Terrence Davis is the answer, or, or maybe that means that like, like Terrence Davis comes in at the herder slides down to the three. Like, I, I think that there's, I, I had a, a little bit of a, I guess, semi revelation of like, maybe they view this guy as the backup three. And I just hadn't been thinking of it as that is like a real possibility. I just, I don't know where else Terrence Davis plays. And I think Terrence Davis should play. Theoretically, or at least on paper, the skill sets that he provides are something that the Kings could use. He's one of the best shooters on the team. And before he got hurt last season, he was actually putting together some really, really good performances. Now, he is streaky. He admits he's streaky. I remember asking him last preseason about developing more consistency. And he said that's something that he's definitely trying to work on. But we've seen nights where he'd go ice cold and other nights where he'd be red hot. So that streakiness, uh, if he could develop that more to a, a consistent presence, especially offensively on a nightly basis. And we do believe that he can provide something on defense as well. I think there's a spot for him in the rotation or there needs to be a spot for him in the rotation. I just don't know with Malik Monk and Kevin Herter here, how he gets any time as a two. Yeah, I think that's definitely a good point. And if you look at like his splits and basketball references, numbers here aren't are far from, but through the 530 minutes he played last year, it has 51 of them coming at the small forward the year prior. He also played just under six, Hundred minutes with Sacramento, forty-six of them came at the small forward. The Kings have run these like small ball lineups for, for a little while now. Like, these three guard lineups is the way to say it. Whether that be like 
buddy bogey or buddy and td bogey and td like we've kind of maybe bogey and td didn't overlap and i have that wrong but you know we've seen these three guard lineups a lot from sacramento and it's a new coaching staff so we'll have to see if mike brown does kind of elect to go that way because i think offensively it works fine right and we've heard mike brown say position basketball mm -hmm. um which is a more and more common term nowadays but i think it's just about um certain matchups and positions in my mind have more to do with the defensive end of the floor and i think that it's just is terrence davis at six four big enough to slow down some of these wings and i think when you're talking backings that you probably can get away with it um but i think it comes down to what you laid out of terrence davis deserves to play and this is probably the spot that he fits yeah, you hit the nail on the head. It's it's positionless basketball offensively, but position matters defensively, I think, with this group, especially if they want to improve defensively. And the major question is, can Terrence Davis consistently defend the three? And these are questions that aren't specific to Terrence or Kent Bazemore, who we're going to talk about. These are questions that are specific to this entire roster. Like, this is going to be a complete overhaul of, can this team guard this position? Which players on this roster can guard this position? And which lineups can guard consistently together? And Terrence Davis or Kent Bazemore need to work themselves into that spot. The question is, though, like, it, I mean, defensively, is that your biggest question mark with Davis at that three spot? Or is it his size? Like, is what is the hesitation with Terrence Davis predominantly playing the three here in Sacramento. Yeah, I th think it's the size, which also like translates defense, right? And I think it's different when you're talking about him defending other backups. Like, I, I think that that's where you can get away with it because the starting wings throughout the league, I definitely don't think that you want to throw Terrence Davis out there. And I think there's a lot of things in the league that are, um, you know, more not dimensional and I, I think more, uh, have their strengths with just certain skills that would make it a little bit easier for Terrence Davis to defend rather than some of these all-rounded um, starters that we're talking about. And I think that there could be nights where Terrence Davis doesn't play and you elect to go for a, a Bazemore that we're going to get into or a KZ Paula, who is the other side of this where I think he's all defense and are you going to get anything on offense? So I, I think that when it comes to these guys at the end, it is going to be a little bit situational, but I think my concerns with Davis at the three uh, do mainly have to do with his size and still honestly don't have a great feel on how I feel about him defensively in general. Like, I think that there's moments. I think that he's decent on ball. Um, his awful rotations and like awareness and processing speeds, I don't know that I have a great feel for. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'll watch a little bit more because there's, almost 3,000 minutes of Terrence Davis at this point in his career. But I don't know. It's just so streaky, I feel like, on both ends of the floor for him that it's hard to get a gauge. How, how do you feel about him in general as a defender? Yeah, I, I've seen the moments too. And I I just I have a hard time making a defensive argument against one player when I can easily make the same defensive argument for Malik Monk, who has not shown his his defensive prowess really at all throughout the course of his career. But that's a challenge. And that that kind of brings me to a question that I've asked myself and I'll pose it to you and the listeners out there, too, because I think it's very possible. Terrence, it's not out of the realm of possibility that Terrence Davis comes into this season and and, and performs well enough that. And this is kind of separate from the conversation that we're talking about, about him being a backup three. But like it, it, I think a lot of people are treating this like, OK, Kevin Herter and Malik Monk are absolutely solidified in that two guard spot. Terrence Davis has no chance to 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 work his way in. I don't think that's impossible. I think that's probable that he doesn't work his way in and that Herter and Monk hold down that position. I think the Kings are also kind of hoping for that based off of the fact that they acquired him this offseason. But there is a scenario where Terrence Davis is shooting well enough, playing well enough offensively and it's defensively locked in enough where maybe he does take Monk's spot or does take Herter's spot, depending upon if they want to move Herter down to the three or not. So I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility either with TD. Which is a good problem to have, right? I think it's something we touched on in one of these previous episodes of like the Kings are in a scenario where or it could be in a scenario now where it's like, man, we have this guy sitting there that we need to get minutes for because he's that caliber of player, but we don't exactly know how to do it. And in years prior, it was, oh my God, we have minutes to fill and nobody that we feel comfortable filling those minutes. So I think it's definitely a good one to have. I think my initial reaction when Monk was signed was 
kind of thinking maybe he's a little bit redundant with TD. And I think that Monk is better. I, I think that they do have their differences. But I, I totally agree with you. I think there's a world where TD out from Smunk. I'm not betting on that or anything. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that's definitely within the realm of possibility. And um, it's a good scenario for the Kings. You know, I wouldn't mind some more positional balance with a few more wings forwards. But I'm certainly not complaining at this shooting guard depth. Is it? Am I correct in feeling? My feeling is Malik Monk would have more trade value than than Terrence Davis would at the deadline, but that Terrence Davis is more likely to be moved out of the two of them. And by that, I mean I, I would imagine Terrence Davis is being attached to some sort of bigger deal. Like the Kings aren't going to get much of value. No disrespect to Terrence Davis, but in reality, the Kings aren't going to get much of value for Terrence Davis straight up at the trade deadline. But if they decide to move on from Harrison Barnes, maybe TD is attached to that deal. I, I I don't know what the deal is out there that you move Terrence Davis that lands you the improvement that the Kings are hoping to get. Hopefully they're not just blowing things up because it's been a colossal failure at that point. I don't know what Terrence Davis gets you at the trade deadline that helps you solidify a playoff spot, but I feel like out of the two, he's more than likely, or he's, he's the more likely one to be moved over Malik Monk. I would think the same. I, I think that just Monk having another year on his deal would make him a little bit more valuable to Sacramento. I think that TD's off court concerns also mm -hmm. play a factor in some of his value. I mean, Sacramento for a second round pick yep. um, a year and a half ago at this point. So I, I think that that is pretty telling for his value, but I agree with you. I think if TD were to be moved on from, it would be something like a, um, in addition with Rashawn Holmes or an Alex Len as something that's a, a little bit He's definitely a plus. I think he's a positive value. Um, he's still fairly young. You know, he's 25 years old, I, I guess kind of young. Uh, was on that all-rookie the first year that he had, had in Toronto. So I think there is the potential there. But between the two of them, more likely to be moved. I, I would definitely lean towards TD. Terrence's main competition, I feel, for that backup three spot is Kent Bazemore. And I am a big fan of Kent Bazemore. I really like Kent. I like him as a person. I like him as a basketball player. I thought he played very, very well for the Sacramento Kings uh, after the uh, Atlanta trade a couple of years ago when he came in with, uh, with oh, I'm sorry, not Atlanta. He came from Portland, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Was it Portland? Honestly, I they all so. played together. He for... did come from Portland with Anthony Tolliver, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he was he was in there. He was formerly with the Atlanta Hawks. Uh, but I I really like what Kent Bazemore brought at that time. I like what he can bring. Now his last couple seasons, he kind of just wasted away in both LA and Golden State. Like he didn't do anything really, and his numbers reflect that. Like he didn't get a whole lot of playing time and. Um, he he kind of bounced around, and I think his value has diminished because of the last couple of seasons. And when he did play, there were times that he didn't play that well. Um, so I'm hoping that Kent can get back to the way that he was playing with the Sacramento Kings a couple of seasons ago, and it was just half a season from the trade deadline on. In my opinion, he needs to play like that if he's going to have any shot of getting a consistent rotational spot. But maybe at this point in his career, that's too much to ask from him. It might be, Matt. You like, I think that it's pretty telling that he couldn't find a spot on that Lakers roster last year. I think Urs really lacked depth and admittedly shooting, which is not baseball strong suit, but I think the Sacramento falls into a little bit of a similar uh, scenario there with shooting being so important. But I think that he's still a, a good playmaker, somebody that can bring the ball up the floor um, and kind of make decent reads from there. He's an okay finisher at the rim. The defensive engagement isn't something that I feel like question mark all too long with Bazemore. But for him to get benched after 13 games with LA last year and then only end up playing one, two, uh, three, four games past that point where he played more than 15 minutes, I think is really telling on a Lakers team that again, it was like really desperate to find more players who could fit in their rotation. But he's just coming from two organizations that I think are viewed as some of the better organizations in the league, even if LA uh, had a mess of a season, like familiarity with Mike Brown. And, you know, even in all of his struggles, uh, take value this however much you want, but he's a guy on the bench that's always standing up and cheering for his teammates. and. I, in my mind, I think that Terrence, um, Ken Bazemore, excuse me, is viewed as a really good team 
teammate and presence to have a locker room. And I think there's value in that. When Kent was traded to the Kings, he and Anthony Tolliver actually held a uh, a meeting in the locker room and, and told the Kings players like, hey, we're in a playoff race or we're in a play-in race. We're, we're better than this. We can make uh, make the playoffs. And of course, I, I think we believe that was the um, the 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 year of the bubble and with everything that happened. So that kind of threw everything for a loop. But that kind of shows the leadership and, and and kind of the locker room presence that Terrence Davis is that I do think is valuable for this team. And again, we're talking about like the 10th spot here and what's potentially a nine man rotation. So someone who may only play a handful of minutes every now and then, and, and when they do their role won't be uh, too significant. So by that, my, my way of thinking with that is okay. I don't think Kent Bazemore fits very well with De'Aaron Fox and DeMontis Sabonis because he can't shoot. But in my, I, I imagine when Kent Bazemore would play, it would be primarily with the second unit to where maybe he's out there with a Davion. Maybe he's out there uh, with a Malik Monk, assuming he's coming off the bench. He's out there with other guys who can space the floor a little bit better so that he can be the one to maybe attack the basket and work his way around the rim uh, in mid-range game. That's that's the way that my brain makes it make sense with how he can fit offensively. But then again, he might not have to fit offensively. He could just be a body, a presence defensively, a hard worker, a hustle guy. He can run the floor. Uh, so maybe he does enough of the little things that he's okay to put out there in different spots for, for spot minutes. I think spot minutes for sure. I agree with you. I, I think almost as like kind of a discount Iguodala at this point in his career where it's like, okay, if these other guys aren't getting in base more, just go out there, calm everybody down, try to control the game and just get everybody back on track. And I think it's kind of what you can look ba look towards base more for somebody to um, kind of be initiating the offense and try to minimize turnovers, even though he's a little bit turnover himself times. Um, but and then I think just kind of locking everybody in on defense, being a on the floor when it comes to defensive intensity and hoping everybody else kind of falls in line there. So I, I think that I agree with you with Bazemore. To me, it's spot minutes and probably more of like these other guys aren't getting it done. And Bazemore, you're the vet. Go out, out there and, and do what you do and, and get everybody back on track. Today's episode of the Locked on Kings podcast is brought to you by Rocket Money. And I've actually been telling you about Rocket Money for a while. It was just known by a different name, Truebill. You've heard me talk about Truebill before, now called Rocket Money. And Truebill, Rocket Money, is something that has saved me significant money immediately. It's something that the George family now completely exclusively uses to manage our money. And it saved me money immediately as soon as I signed up because it helped me uh, manage my subscriptions. It made me aware of little $5, $8, $10, $15 subscriptions each month that I had that I had completely forgotten about. And look, of course I could go through my bank statements online and find them, but instead of going through that hassle, Rocket Money does all that hard work for you. It finds your subscriptions, it lets you know which ones you have, and it lets you know which ones are easy to get rid of, and they can even cancel them for you. Rocket Money should be used by your family, should be used by just you if you're by yourself because it can cancel those unnecessary uh, subscriptions, help you manage your budgets, help you uh, let you know where you're spending money in certain areas versus other areas. It's really helped me and my family find out like how much money we're spending on groceries and gas. And, and things like that. Rocket Money is incredibly useful. I would say must have uh, in the year 2022 and beyond. Get rid of useless subscriptions with Rocket Money now. Go to rocketmoney.com slash locked on. Seriously, it could save you hundreds of dollars per year like it did me. That's rocketmoney.com slash locked on. This final battle that we're going to look at is very different from all the rest because it, it, it's Alex Len versus Nemias Keita, and I personally feel that both these guys are going to make the roster. Keita, because he's a two-way contract, so he's going to have his time with, with Stockton, and he's going to have his time with Sacramento. And Alex Len, just as a third center, although if they decide to cut Alex Len, it wouldn't surprise me, it wouldn't shock me necessarily, but I think there's a probably a 13th or 14th spot for Alex Len, and then Keita, like I said, gets the two-way contract. But the, the, the conversation here is backup, 
backup center minutes, right? The expectation is that it's going to be DeMontis Sabonis at the five and then Rashawn Holmes backing him up. And uh, I I like the idea of Rashawn Holmes coming off the bench, but we've seen with both of them that they can get hurt from time to time. Rashawn had a injury plagued season last year. So there could be a chance of the third string big getting a handful of minutes this season. And the debate is, do you go with someone in Alex Len and Brendan, I'll let you start with whatever player you want to talk about here. Do you go with Alex Len, who has been an NBA player who does some really good things, rebounds can protect the rim, although he's not necessarily known for that. I think he sets really good screens and could work in pick and roll uh, scenarios with both De'Aaron Fox and uh, Davion Mitchell. Or do you go with the young two-way contract or uh, two-way uh, prospect in Nemeas Keda, who showed in summer league that he has more of a refined offensive game than people gave him credit for. He showed off that jump shot a little bit. And with his sheer size, he should be a rim protector and a good rebounder. Yeah. I think the reason that this is maybe more important than some people think it is, is because Rashawn Holmes, I would imagine is on the trade block mm -hmm. all year. Mm -hmm. And so if Holmes has moved on and you know, the Kings have a need for, or a small forward, as we've touched on, that if you want to be able to move homes for a small forward, all of a sudden, one of these Len or Keda is your backup center. And I know that Sabonis is expected to play, what, like 35 minutes, and you're only talking 13 minutes, but that's still a decent amount of time in an NBA game. And I think that makes this a little bit more important than some people realize. Um, and there's a chance that Holmes gets on from and, and they bring in another center as a part of that deal, and maybe that's the solution. But I personally think it comes back down to trust, which kind of realizing in the course of these conversations that maybe that is a, a common factor here mm -hmm. for a lot of these. And I think that I definitely trust more so at this sure. point. And that's not a knock on Kato who's 23 and really uh, just coming off of his rookie year, a very raw player. I, I think it's easy to overlook how thin he was um, during his first couple years at Utah State. And then he slowly put on weight. And I, I think that the transition process for Kata specifically, someone that came over and didn't even know all that much English uh, coming over from Portugal to Utah State. And I, I think that just the transition is totally expected and fine and nothing bad about Kata at all. I think that this is just how his career trajectory probably was expected, at least in my eyes. But Alex Len is a 29-year-old who's spent what is it, seven years in the league at this point, I believe. And you know what you're getting. You mentioned the screen setting. I, I think the rebounding is is fine from him for a backup. Um, there's some moments where he's like willing to space the floor and, and possibly capable of doing that, specifically this one year in Atlanta where he shot 36% from three on two and a half a game. He was willing to put him up when he was just playing in Eurobasket with Ukraine. Um, so I, I think that, if you can keep him near the rim, he's also a pretty solid defender. It's the foot movements outside of that that maybe isn't great for him. But I feel a lot more confident in Len. And I think that Kata should just be getting a lot of reps with Stockton. And if he performs well, like I definitely give him the opportunities in Sacramento. But I think relying to be the third string or maybe even eventual backup if Holmes was moved on from would be pretty worrisome for me. It's very similar in some ways to the conversation that we had with Keegan Murray and, and Alex Len. Keegan Murray, we know, is an NBA player, unlike Kata at this point. But the question is, was really like, does it does Keegan Murray hurt you starting right away and 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 working himself through that young player, the, that grind and the acclimation to the NBA? Does it hurt you to let him figure that out on the floor as a starter versus Trey Lyles, who knows what the NBA is like, but doesn't obviously have the ceiling that, that Keegan Murray does. I'm not saying that Kata necessarily has a higher ceiling than Alex Len. I think the Kings are hopeful they can develop him into something that it does have a higher ceiling than Alex Len. But uh, I pose the same question. Do you think if the Kings were to give Kata that third string center spot, and maybe at times it becomes the second string center, whether it's because of trades or injuries or whatever, does it hurt them too much or more to give Kata that opportunity to kind of figure it out on the floor than it does to just go to Alex Len, who might not be as exciting or, or be as good in some areas, 
but is like you say trustworthy. I think they could get killed in the Cato minutes. Mm. To be honest, I don't know that. I think he also could in and work fine in those moments. Like, I think that against other backup bigs, he could make it work. Um, but I don't know. Like, if you're playing the Lakers and it's against Damian Jones, I'm betting Damian Jones over yeah. over Cato. If you're playing Golden State and why am I drawing a blank on their backup? Even if you put them against Looney or, or Draymond, God forbid, forbid. Like I, I think that um, Kada is really struggling in those matchups. You know, like I think it's unfair that I definitely think of the game that they played against Cleveland and, and Kada was getting torched by Jared Allen. That's probably a little bit of an unfair bar right now, considering Allen was an all-star last and I don't think Kada should be up against opposing starters. I think that's a recipe for dinner. Mm-hmm. I think there's moments against other backups where it could work fine but I, if i have to pick between the two sides i think it's more like that it doesn't go well and sure we're only talking about 15 12 minutes but like you know as well as i'm at like that can change the tide of a game pretty quickly absolutely now when you say killed are you are you thinking killed defensively as in he won't be able to stop anybody he's too slow to stop anybody or, or maybe just doesn't have a high enough nba basketball iq to stop anybody or is it all around too do you have concerns about kata's ability to score or be effective for sacramento offensively and it's not just him putting up points for himself it's him knowing how to fit in with the king's offense where to set screens when to roll when to step out and, and potentially hit a three or spaced floor it's it's that as well yeah for me i think it's the defense which is definitely where most intriguing as a prospect, right? Like I, I think that there is tremendous potential there with his um, supreme like height and bounce that he has at that height and the strength that he's getting more and more accustomed to with, with each passing year. But I, I think that, you know, young tendency to kind of jump a lot, especially young shot blocker, a little hungry to get those blocks rather than just diverting uh, opposing attempts. And I think that we saw that a little bit in these couple of games he played with Portugal too, but he's able to jump and then land and then get a, you know, patented Marvin Bagley second and jump and get away with it just fine um, against, you know, talents like Romania and these other teams that maybe their big man is like six, eight at best um, that he's able to get away with it a little bit more. So I think it's just still getting accustomed to, the speed of the NBA game and honestly his own body. That was something that he talked about uh, before the California classic. When we got to talk to him a little bit that things for him this off season is just working on his body. And I think he's the biggest guy out there nearly every single, if not every game throughout both the Cal classic and the Vegas summer league. Um, and I think that utilizing that and being accustomed to that is still something that, is maybe a little bit of a process in my mind. The Kings have recently had two two-way players who were converted to main contracts in Shemezi Metu and Damian Jones, who you mentioned is now with the Los Angeles Lakers. Between Kada and Keon Ellis, which one do you think has the better chance to become a two-way player? I think it's Ellis right away for me personally. Just And, and it's not just that I think Ellis is a better player than Kata. I actually don't think that's that's the case. I think they're pretty even right now, and Kata at least has one year of Stockton experience that, that Ellis doesn't have. But I look at Ellis's skill set, especially as a wing perimeter defender, and I know how much the Kings desperately need that. So that immediately gives Ellis uh, an advantage for me. Yeah, Ellis is definitely intriguing to me, as I've kind of made known. Um, but I think that it just has to do with the build of this roster, sort of the construction of this roster, right? There's so many two guards. And I kind of think that's that's the issue with Ellis is that in my mind, that's kind of his only position. Mm-hmm. We talked about why I think he struggles a little bit as a point guard and maybe asking him to play the three is a little much. Um, I'd feel more confident in Ellis, but I think just the nature of the positions that they play, I might lean Kata because I, I think that it's, Saying an easier role is probably not fair, but I think that less is asked of bigs in today's NBA, and I think it's easier to get away with that compared to a guy like Ellis. I think Ellis is more NBA ready, but I think just when it comes to the construction of this roster, that I I would maybe lean Kata. Breaking my heart here, though, having to pick against Ellis. So decision time here. 
the first decision I think is pretty clear for both of us, and that's the the Alex Len versus Namias Keda uh, decision for the backup backup or the third string center minutes. Sounds like we're both leaning towards Alex Len, although I think I'm a little more open minded than maybe you might be to Keda just getting the opportunity to to try and quite honestly fail out there a little bit if they if it's in spot minutes and small stretches. And I'm not just talking about at the end of a blowout. Uh, I don't think it would handicap the Kings too bad and I was impressed by some of the things that I saw from Kata and Summer League and want to see if he's able to translate some of that into the actual uh, NBA itself although I do agree if you're playing uh, Kata in six to eight minute stretches that the Kings could find themselves on the uh, the wrong end of, of some pretty big runs there so I trust Alex Len so I, I personally would pick Alex Len at this point but I don't think it's unreasonable to give Kata some looks and some opportunity uh, over the course of the season. Yeah, I, I think that makes sense to me. I, I hope that my, my goal for Kata this year, what like I would think is a success, yeah, spot minutes here and there where he looks like he belongs out there. Stockton. I, I think that I'd like to see that before he came up to the Sacramento roster, but in a pinch, I, I think that trying him is definitely makes sense. Uh, there's moments where he's shown passing on the off end as well. So, and, and good finishing with both hands. So it's definitely intriguing. And then the, this one's a little more difficult. The decision between Terrence Davis and Kent Bazemore. Do you want to start with, uh, with, with who you would pick out of those two? Yeah, I'm going Terrence Davis. Um, just, just because I have, to me, the debate comes down to like, I think Terrence Davis is a better player, but Bazemore is a better positional fit. And I mm. think that you just put your better player out there and try to figure out how to make it work. And maybe that hurts you too much on defense, and then you do have to look towards Bazemore. Um, but I think in my mind, Bazemore gets the or, um, Terrence Davis gets the edge. And then if that's not working, then you can look towards Bazemore. But for me, I, I would originally try it with TD. Where are you at? Yeah, I'm I'm in the same boat. If if Kevin Herter weren't here and it was still like Dante DiVincenzo, then I think I would lean more towards. Kent Bazemore just, uh, uh, but because the Kings have already the expectation of using kind of versatile pieces who will play different positions. And we are going to see some small lineups. I think a lot this season, hopefully they'll defensively be able to hold up uh, when they do. I just, I don't, I don't know how Terrence Davis doesn't play. Like I just think Terrence Davis is too good not to play and to just sit there and to be behind someone like Kent Bazemore, who again, I am a fan of Kent Bazemore. I do think Kent Bazemore offers some things for the Kings. There might be situations where one game it is Davis if they need scoring another game. It's it's Bazemore if they need size and defensively. So it, it could be a set spot that one has more opportunity over the other, but it's very situational when they get playing time. But if I were to choose between the two for my rotation, it's Terrence Davis. Yeah, it makes sense. I think Mike Brown has some interesting scenarios to kind of figure out, and and that's the big kind of X in all of this, right? I, I think that we don't know what Mike Brown's just looks like, and and that's the big debate here. Well, let's uh, let's now hear from you, listeners out there. Who are you deciding, Kent Bazemore or Terrence Davis, Alex Len or Namias Keda? Send us uh, your thoughts. Let us know at Matt George Sack on Twitter at Brendan Nunez NBA. Uh, on Twitter, and you can also uh, reach me via email, mattgeorgesports at gmail.com. Big thank you to Brendan for joining me here throughout the course of this entire series, and for you tuning in and listening to all these, and so many of you have been weighing in on these debates, weighing in on these conversations. Again, you can do so on Twitter, at MattGeorgeSack. You can email me, MattGeorgeSports at gmail.com, or if you're watching on YouTube, uh, get involved in the conversation in the YouTube comment section down below. But with both of these, they're not necessarily the most major decisions to make as Brendan and I broke down, but I think Terrence Davis deserves some kind of playing time. The backup three may be his easiest way in. Do you agree with that? Disagree with that? Would you play Terrence Davis, play Kent Bazemore? Uh, the Alice Len versus Namias Keda conversation I think is interesting. One has obviously had significantly more NBA experience than the other, but the Kings clearly view Keda as a project worthy of their two-way contract, and maybe he can turn into something valuable for the franchise going forward. So where are you at with that conversation as well? 
please weigh in. I would appreciate it. Again, we are a week away from Sacramento Kings media day. So the coverage gets ramped back up here very, very shortly. Again, thank you for uh, sticking with us through the driest part of the year here on the Locked on Kings podcast. Still more great content coming for you this week, more great interviews, things like that. Uh, I'll have great uh, content for you coming from media day next week. So I'm ready. It's almost here, everybody. It's almost here, and I am ready. Hope you are, too. Thank you so much for your support. Can't wait to have you join me on the next episode of Locked on Kings. Until then, my name is Matt George. You have been listening to the Locked on Kings podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network.